Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Well, what should be our ultimate goal as Christians? Well, it's certainly not to get everything that we want the way we want it when we want it. However, what our goal should be is mentioned in today's message, so please stay with us. I'm actually talking about learning the importance of imitating God. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5:1 that we are to be imitators of God. In Isaiah 54, it says the ideal servant of the Lord should be reproduced in us. Being a Christian is not about just a weekly trip to church, but we need to develop the character of God in our own lives and let that be displayed through us so people can actually see Jesus. Let's go to Romans 8, 29. It says, for those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning, foreordaining them to be molded into the image of his Son, to share inwardly his likeness, that he might become the firstborn among many brethren. So you might say that Jesus is the master copy, because he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do what I see the Father do. And we call him our master. So let's just say that he's the master copy, but he wants millions and millions and millions of duplicates running around all over the place. That's your goal as a Christian. Your goal is not just to get everything you want. Your goal is not to get to the point where you never have anything bother you or where the devil never comes against you. Your goal is to represent God in this earth and learn to act like him so people who need him can see him through you. Amen? So tonight we're going to talk about the love of God and some different aspects of the love of God because what we learn in the Bible is that everything God gives to us, He wants it to go through us. You can't give away something you don't have. You can't be merciful, for example, if you don't learn how to receive the mercy of God for yourself. God is love. It's not just something He does, it's who He is. But the Bible talks about various types of love, actually the Greek uses three different Greek words, and we translate all of them the same as love, but they have a little different meanings. The word phileo means friendship and tender affection. Well, we can all have affection for chocolate, but God wants us to go a little deeper and a little higher than that, amen? What we're talking about is different than that. Then there's eros, which is where we get our word erotic from, and it's what we feel for a lover. There's nothing wrong with it, but we do have to understand that it, it just comes and goes. And so God is calling us to something deeper and something higher than that. The kind of love that God is calling us to is the agape of God. And that is the kind of love, the kind of attitude and behavior that God has toward His Son and toward the human race. It's a whole different type of love. Agape sacrifices. For God so loved the world that He gave His only. He gave His only. If you get a bad attitude when somebody receives an offering in a church service, then you desperately need this message tonight. Because love wants to give. It doesn't feel put out when it's asked to give. It looks for reasons to give. When you're giving with a good attitude, you're more like God than at any other time in your life. Thank you for that one person over there who agrees with me. Let me say it again. When you're giving with a good attitude, you're more like God than at any other time in your life. You say, why? For God gives. His whole nature is to give. So love sacrifices. It gives. It's not selfish. Love is patient. One of the very first aspects of love that we find in 1 Corinthians 13 is love is patient. 
It's kind, it's good, it's merciful, it's faithful. It always rejoices with others in their joy. It's not jealous of somebody else's success. It's not proud and haughty, but it's humble. Actually, I think we can safely say that love is just absolutely a beautiful thing. And I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but I am so hungry to see real love. I am so hungry to see people in the body of Christ really representing God and loving one another the way that we should be loving one another. The beautiful thing about our conferences is we've got people here from every denomination and no denomination. We've got people that are Baptist and people that are Pentecostal and people that are Baptist Pentecostal holies. You haven't made your mind up yet what you are. Amen? Let's go to Matthew 5 and look at the kind of love that God is calling us to. I preach a lot on love, and I actually tried to get out of it tonight and preach something else, but I never could get peace about doing anything other than this. And so I really feel like that this is part of the legacy that God wants me to leave in these latter years of my life, because after preaching for 32 years, I've come to the conclusion that this is indeed the most important message in the Bible. And I need it a lot. So even if you don't want it, I'll preach to myself tonight, because every time I hear it, it helps me behave better. And you know, I find that we're inherently selfish, and if we don't have a lot of teaching and a lot of encouragement like this, we just begin to, begin to drift off again into what about me, what about me, what about me, what about me? Amen? You gotta declare war against selfishness. You gotta be good to people on purpose. You've got to study what love is. It's not just a word we throw around. Well, I love you, sister, with the love of the Lord. <laughs> oh, give me a break. <laughs> what is that? Where are you at when I need help moving? <laughs> Where are you at when I need a ride? <laughs> Where are you at when I can't pay my rent? Because I lost my job, but you still got yours. And Come on now. But I love you with the love of the Lord. We have to study love. Love can be seen. It can be felt in many, many different ways. Love has to be carried through vehicles to get to people. Love is patient. You can love people by being patient with them. You can love people by being understanding with them. You can love people by things you say. You can love people by things that you choose not to say that you could say. Come on. I know sometimes it's so hard for me not to tell Dave. You left the light on in your closet again. Does God ever just tell you to shut up? I don't know if He talks to you like that, but He'll just... Just like you don't need to say anything. Just turn it off and zip your lip. <laughs> Amen? It sacrifices. It's not selfish. It's patient, kind. It's good to people. How often? All the time. All right. They were here last night, in case you don't get that. <laughs> Love is merciful. It's faithful. We're going to talk about faithfulness tonight. It always rejoices with others. So many beautiful things about love. Matthew 5, 44, let's look at the kind of love that we're talking about here. A different kind of love, a higher kind, a deeper kind. But I tell you, love your enemies. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> and pray for those who persecute you. Mm. To show, <laughs> to show that you are the children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the wicked and the good and he makes the rain fall upon the upright and the wrongdoers alike. For if you just love those who love you, what reward can you get from that? <laughs> don't even tax collectors and sinners do that? You don't need to be saved to love people that love you. Anybody can do that. You don't need to have the power of the Holy Ghost in your life to be good to people that are good to you. Anybody can do that. That doesn't take any effort at all. That's, we, we've got emotion for that. There's feelings that will motivate us to that. 
If you love those who love you, what reward do you get for that? Even tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your brethren, what more than others are you doing? Do not even the Gentiles, the heathen do that? You therefore must be perfect. Now the Amplified Bible tells us what that word means. Growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character. Mind and character. Having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity as your heavenly Father is perfect. As Christians, we have to grow. God's not bothered that we haven't arrived. None of us will arrive while we're in this fleshly body. Paul said, I've not arrived. I've not reached the place of perfection. But we need to be growing. We need to be able to look back at our lives and see changes in us. If you've been going around and around the same silly mountain for the last 20 years, it's time to leave that place tonight and go on beyond it. If you've already heard a hundred messages on forgiving your enemies, you don't really need another message. You need to just do it. Amen? If you know every scripture about giving and you're still not doing it, then stop making silly excuses and just start giving. Hmm. <laughs> You know why? Because we're only blessed through our obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. We got to stop singing songs about loving God if we're not going to obey him to the best of our ability. We're not going to hit it perfect. We're going to make mistakes. I told you earlier before we started recording that I got upset over the silly remote control on the television a couple of weeks ago and didn't act very nice for about a minute or two. And then I repented and asked God to forgive me. And you never fail if you don't stop trying. The righteous can fall seven times, they get up again and keep on going. Come on. I said you never fail if you don't stop trying. So when I lost my temper that night, I'm writing this great spiritual book and I lost my temper. And you know, of course you, you feel kind of bad about that. You know, if you think you feel bad, you ought to be doing this and see how you feel when you mess up. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I, I'm writing this book on finding a way to celebrate everything, so how am I going to be able to celebrate that I lost my temper? And then I got it. I can celebrate the fact that I can be forgiven and I don't have to be condemned. Amen? Don't let the devil mess you up without guilt and condemnation. To be perfect just means that you have a heart that you want to grow. You want to be like God. You want to do it right. And messages like this, you should just eat them up. I mean, you should just love them and just say more, 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 more. You should buy resources on some of the tougher stuff, not just dessert messages. Don't just buy things and read books that are about your prosperity and your breakthrough and you're this and you're that and you're something else. Get some of the stuff about dying to selfishness, dying to the flesh, growing up, developing character, becoming like God, becoming Christ-like. I said last night, I think it's a statement from Moody. I don't know exactly who, but I think that's who said it, that character is what develops in the dark. Amen? You don't get character when everything is nice. You don't really learn what love is when you're just loving people who love you back. You don't really learn what love is when you're just loving people that are nice to you. But when you start praying for your enemies and being good to people that mistreat you, and instead of just going to your friends in church that you're comfortable with, you go find the foreigner and the stranger, the person that looks like they're miserable and alone, and even though you're not maybe going to enjoy it, you go do it for them. Love does good things for other people. It doesn't just do what makes it comfortable. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're acting. This kind of love, this agape, is not an impulse that comes from a feeling. It's an act of the will, and it may or may not include feelings. Some days I feel like being nice, some days I don't. Some days I feel like being giving, and some days I don't. Some days I feel like being friendly, but there's days where I just want to be left alone. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I go to the grocery store once in a while just because I want to be normal. I want to feel normal. And somebody will come up, well, what are you doing here? <laughs> Can't believe you're here. It's like, I got to be somewhere. <laughs> I don't live in the box. 
Amen. I got a life. Maybe on that day, I don't want to be friendly. Maybe I just want to buy my fruit and go home. But love. Come on. You know how it is. Love requires some type of action for it to be seen or felt. It's not just this nothing. <laughs> Love does something. It, it has certain behaviors. It acts certain ways. And you know, this is very important to me because to be honest, I threw the word love around for probably at least 16, 17 years as a Christian before I ever bothered to study it deeply to find out what it was. Amen? You ought to have every book that you can find on love. You ought to have every person's teaching that you could find on love. And you need to be reading something on the love walk on some kind of a continuing, rotating basis because it's the hardest thing to get and maintain. One of the reasons why we don't walk in love is because love will always cost you something. Every time you really walk in the agape of God, it will cost you something. You'll have to do something you don't want to do, give away something you'd rather keep, Behave in a way that you don't feel like behaving. Love is costly. It costs Jesus his life. It costs Father God his son. How's the world going to know we're Christians? Because we got a bumper sticker? Oh, there's a Christian. Well, maybe not. They're speeding. Oh, and... What was that I just saw you do? Hmm. <laughs> By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, if you keep on showing love among yourselves. Amen? Amen. We need to show love among ourselves. And I don't know about you, but I have to do it on purpose most days. Words can express love, or not saying words can express love. Acts of service can express love. Giving, listening. You know, to be honest, I don't really like to listen to stuff I'm not interested in. I know it's selfish, I'm just telling you the truth. It's the hardest thing in the world for me to stand and listen to somebody if I couldn't care less what they're saying. Come on. But how many of you, when you're interested in something and you're telling it, you want somebody to listen and pay attention? Now, on the other hand, nothing aggravates me worse than when I'm trying to talk to somebody and they're acting like they don't want me to keep talking. <laughs> Give and it shall be given unto you. Being patient with other people is a way that you can show love. A lot of wonderful things about love. I want us to look at a few scriptures in 1 John. Let's go to 1 John 4, 7 and 8. We've got to get ourselves stirred up in love. 1 John 4, 7, beloved. Now, I want you to really pay attention to these scriptures. These are so powerful. Every time I read these scriptures, I just sit and just shake my head. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And he who loves his fellow man is begotten and born of God and is coming progressively to know and understand God, <laughs> to perceive and recognize and get a better and a clearer knowledge of him. He who does not love has not become acquainted with God, does not and never did know him, for God is love. Uh-oh. So what about all these people that say they know God that are so mean? <laughs> if we're going to believe what this scripture says, it says, look, if you're treating people bad, then you don't know God. You may be religious, but you don't know God. Religious people are the worst of the lot. Jesus said, you are like a bunch of whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. You tell everybody else what to do, but you won't lift a finger to help anybody. Now, I have to be honest and tell you that I used to be a Pharisee. 
I think I could have been the chief of the Pharisees. <laughs> I mean, I pet on my religious act. But if I'm honest, I wasn't really doing anything to help anybody. I think we have to ask ourselves, what am I doing to help anybody? What am I doing to make somebody else's life better? Am I just in this thing so God will make my life better? Giving God my 20-point prayer list every morning of things He has to do in order for me to stay saved that day. <laughs> I feel kind of honored tonight. I think I'll take it out on you. First John 4, 9, in this the love of God was made manifest and displayed where we are concerned that God sent His Son, the only begotten or unique Son to the world so that we might live through Him. Verse 11, beloved, if God loved us so very much, we ought to also love one another. <laughs> okay, now I want you to pay attention to verse 12. This is where you get the to you and through you thing. No man has at any time seen God, but if we love one another, God abides. Or another way to put it is, nobody has seen God, but when we're loving one another, God is there. So you see, I finally understood that instead of me sitting around hours a day trying to make this spiritual connection and feel holy, that what I really needed to do was just go about doing good. I needed to get up and pray and spend my time with God and read my Word and make sure I was right and prepared to go out and represent Jesus well. Then I needed to just get out and start doing good, being a blessing everywhere that I go. It's not that difficult. You don't need to live in a Bible study. You need to get out in the world and be a Bible to somebody. Come on now. You know, we hear a lot of stories about some of the mystics hundreds of years ago who would go out in the desert and live there. One guy, I think, lived in a tree or something. I, you know, I forget it all. But, you know, I, that, that, we, we just, we admire that. But sometimes I wonder, what good does that do anybody? You know, it doesn't really do me any good to just sit home and do nothing but try to be spiritual all day. I need to get out and be a blessing to you and through you. Let God teach you something and go out and practice it. Go to church on Sunday morning, learn something, get out there and do it. If you're starting to feel weak, get back at midweek service, get some more, get out there and do it. We need to be doers of the Word. How many of you agree that there's a disconnect here somewhere? That we're educated beyond our level of obedience? No man has seen God, but if we love one another, God abides, lives, and remains in us. And His love, that love was essentially His, is brought to completion to its full maturity, runs its course, and is perfected in us. So here we see it. God pours His love into us at the new birth, Romans 5, 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Now, God loves you, and if you don't think it to death, you can start to enjoy that. What do you mean, think it to death? Well, how could God love me with everything? Mm. Says He loves you. He chose you on purpose, knowing everything about you before He even invited you into relationship with Him. You are not a surprise to God. He is not now saying, what have I done? Before you were in the womb, He knew you and approved of you as His chosen instrument. Just get over the fact that you're not perfect and start worshiping the one that is perfect. <laughs> so God loves you. Nothing you can do about it. He loves you. He never stops loving you. He can't because that's who He is. It's not something He does here and there and on and off and when you're good and when you're not. God loves you you. And until you believe that, until you become rooted and grounded in that, until you know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the love that God has for you, you will live in fear, 
and you will be miserable and you will live under condemnation and you will never, ever, ever be able to love anybody else because you can't give away what you don't have. Well, when we talk about love, we should really know what that looks like. So 1 Corinthians 13, 4 begins and says, Love endures long, is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. And you know something? We can see every one of those beautiful character traits in God. We really want you to know God, not just to know about God but to know God. I don't want you just to know that He exists, but I want you to experience the character traits of God in your own life.